<laughs> Welcome back. Our, our first question, and I may, I may throw this out to you all to answer for us. Uh, our first question, uh, is there any absolute truths? Or is it how we choose to live in our own hearts? So everyone can live differently according to what they believe is right. Example one, example. One can engage in homosexual activity if they truly believe it is okay with God and someone else thinks it would displease them in their heart, so for them it would be sin. Is anything black and white? Yes. 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 <laughs> so are there any absolute truths? Yes. It is absolutely true if you want to live physiologically, you must breathe. It's absolutely true. Yes. It's absolutely true. You have the freedom to, to transgress the law of respiration. You could tie a plastic bag over your head. You have the freedom to do that. You cannot continue to live if you don't remove the plastic bag. You're not free of the consequence of doing that, but you have the freedom to do it. That's an absolute truth. There are many absolute truths. I'm not going to list them because there's too many to list. And one of the, thing, one of the differences between the mature and the immature, Hebrews 5.14, the mature are those who have developed by practice the ability to discern right from the wrong. They can actually tell what's true and what's not true because they've come to understand how God built reality to work and these absolute truths that, uh, that never change. And they are all emanate from God's character, his designs, and how he's built life to operate. Regarding the question of, of um, the homosexual, homosexual question, this is a very interesting one. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart, okay? People, people want, be, uh, from the outward appearance, to be able to make this a black and white question. Well, there, uh, if you read my book, The God-Shaped Heart, you would understand there's a whole host of what are called intersex conditions. There's a condition called, used to be called testicular feminization, now it's called androgen insensitivity syndrome. You may or may not know this, but every fetus starts out phenotypically or the way it looks physically, female with vagina and ovaries, excuse me, vagina, fallopian tubes, uterus. Uh, if they have an, a Y chromosome, the, the material that becomes their gonads turns into testicles, and the testes begin producing several hormones, and the, uh, one of those is anti-Mullerian hormone, which causes the fallopian tubes and uterus and two-thirds of the vagina to dissolve and it begins producing testosterone, and the testosterone will turn in the, uh, the, the tissues into the end organs of male genitalia instead of female genitalia. But in this condition, androgen insensitivity syndrome, the gene that codes for the testosterone receptor is broken. And, and so while they're producing, while they're XY chromosomal male, and they're producing testosterone, they don't have any receptors to see testosterone. So the end organs of the body cannot respond to it, and they don't masculinize, so the baby is born a healthy baby female, girl. This is a genetic condition. Now, that chromosomal individual, chromosomally male, XY chromosome male, born with female genitalia, every, uh, gets a female birth certificate, raises a female, and in adolescents don't start having um, periods. It goes to the doctor. The doctor un identifies what's wrong, surgically removes the testicles, because if they don't, they'll turn cancerous because they didn't descend, and puts them on female hormones, and every country of the world prior to 20 years ago recognized the rights of these individuals to marry men. Is that homosexuality? What, what Bible verse do you uh, use to answer that question? The Bible's silent on this. The Bible doesn't speak on this. And so there's a couple of issues, and one of the problems with the homosexuality question, as I've seen it, is we have taken our modern definition and how some people want to live their lives in same-sex relationships, and we projected it back on the Bible and in culture, in the Bible culture, there was nothing like that that existed. There were no same-sex, monogamous, loving relationships um, being condemned in Scripture. Nothing like that existed. Homosexuality in the Bible, uh, two elements were involved. One, it was historically what you see in the story of Sodom, and you can look this up in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel says, this was your sin of your sister Sodom. They were arrogant, overfed, um, unconcerned, and did disgusting things. And what they did is they, they had a visitor come to town, and they didn't seek a loving, monogamous relationship with that visitor. They sought to dominate, abuse, and exploit that visitor. And so sodomy, or homosexual, homosexuality as described in Scripture, even in the time of Rome, when Paul wrote, was about persons in power dominating, abusing, and exploiting people without power. That's what it represented, and that is evil. 
and it's evil whether you're doing it to men or women. The other thing, so that's one aspect of what the Bible describes and why it's condemned. The other aspect is in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, lays out the problem. He lays it out very clearly so you can understand, if you understand design law, why this is a problem. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. They preferred images made with their own hands to the knowledge of God. In other words, he's describing the problem is false worship and rejecting the knowledge of God. And when you have false worship and reject the knowledge of God, by the law of worship, you become like what you admire in worship, and you have a whole bunch of detestable things that take root in your heart, mind, and character. And there's a long list of them listed there, one of which is, notice one of them, they exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones and became inflamed with lust for the same sex. Now, can you exchange, can I exchange a blue shirt for a white shirt if I don't have a blue shirt to exchange? Or if I'm going to exchange the blue shirt for a white shirt, I have to have a blue shirt. He said they exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. This is a scripture. They actually, he's talking about people who were naturally had heterosexual desires, but through pagan cult fertility worship that they were doing, they inflamed themselves with nat unnatural desires they didn't have before. So they're corrupting what's healthy. A metaphor for this is very simple, and we actually, and so God is saying, that's wrong, we should condemn that. We should condemn corrupting what's healthy and making it unhealthy. We have this in our own society. OSHA has rules on welding. And it's, it's actually illegal to have your a welders if you're an employer hiring somebody and have them weld without eye protection. It is, it is wrong. We condemn having people weld without, because we blind people by doing that. Do we condemn people born blind? Being born blind is not the same thing as people with good vision purposely choosing to do things to destroy their vision. We're not actually condemning blindness. We're condemning the process that creates blindness in people who are not blind. And that's what Paul is condemning, and that's what the Scripture is condemning. But it takes a little deeper thinking than just, we have a rule, and the rule says you don't do something. And that's the imposed law constructs. So that's how I understand that. And so we can still see that same condemnation in our society today with pornography, with, with this grotesque immorality uh, that we're seeing in our society that is, that is destroying. And some of the propaganda going on through adolescents and children right now who are highly vulnerable uh, through, uh, I don't know if you understand, but the average age, is, uh, the, some re something I saw recently said the average age for a child to look at pornography now is age 12. Because of, if, if, if they have a smart device. If you put a smart device in their hand, they will look at pornography at age 12. This is a highly vulnerable time. The normal brain development, there is a wave of neurogenesis, new neurons that produce in girls peaking at age 11 and boys at age 12, followed by several years of brain restructuring and shaping, which corresponds to puberty and sex, secondary sexual development. And if you are then inflaming or, or introducing into children corrupt sexual practices at this time, you can influence many of these very vulnerable, both characterologically and immaturely developed vulnerabilities, but also neurobiologically uh, immature to create desires and attractions for things they never would have had had they not been exposed to this. This is very corrupt, but we condemn this. But understand there is a segment of our society that wants this to happen. Doesn't that really touch on a, on a deep uh, socialization aspect? In other words, people want to feel... Um, sanctioned as positively sanctioned for socializing into something that is traditionally regarded as unacceptable. So there's another element, and that just has, has to do with the typical insecurities of adolescence, where most adolescents go through a period of feeling awkward, feeling insecure, fearful of rejection, and they long for acceptance, validation, and community um, support, so they're very vulnerable to peer pressures. Okay, this is normal developmental, and then if they're in a church, and the church is somewhat judgmental, critical, and then they have a community of, let's say, transvestites that are all loving and supportive and tell them how awesome they are in their, in their and then this, this, this affection and validation of them as a person makes it much more likely that they'll identify with this corruption because they want the validation, even if it's not truly in their heart. So there's an element of vulnerability here as well um, due that, to the, the developmental psychology piece. Do you think that the reason our world was without form and void, water on the face of the deep, chaos and abyss, was because this was where Satan went uh, 
when there was no more room in heaven for him. Why else would God have? Well, yes, I do. I'm going to tell you, I do. And the Bible actually says when he was cast out, he was cast out into the earth. That's where he went. He was sent here. Why else would God have a section of his universe that was this way? Since Satan's only powers are to destroy and ruin, did he do it? Uh, do that to this section of the universe he had freedom to? Then the cre uh, creator came and creation was a contrast of powers. Then God limited Satan to access uh, the earth only at that tree as a means of protection. I, I wouldn't have any problem with that whole thing. I actually think it even it goes more than that. I think be because of the universal nature of the conflict between Christ and Satan and Satan's allegations that he had equality with Christ, that he was sent to this corner of an undeveloped abyss for, uh, and told, okay, you claim equality with, with, with Jesus in heaven? Tell us, show us, show us what you can do. And he can't do anything with it. And then Michael comes along and says, let there be light, let the firmament start. And he begins demonstrating that there's a distinct difference between um, Jesus, the divine son of God, and, and Lucifer, the created being. Yes. I only have one one issue with the, the premise there, and that, that is that God had no more room in heaven for Satan. There's plenty of room for in heaven for Satan. Yeah, I think it's just a, I just thought that was an expression. It, it probably was. Okay, when he was but, cast out. Yes, he was cast out for for obvious reasons. For the purpose of making, I think, for this very purpose. For the purpose of demonstrating. For the demonstration of so all the universe can make a decision. Yes. And so I think that this that this you know, what's it say? If you, several texts you can put together for this. He was cast out into the earth. The, um, the, the earth is a theater, a spectacle to angels and to men, 1 Corinthians 4.9. Um, and, and put these pieces together. You can make a case for this. It's not stated explicitly, but I would have no problem with this. Is the judgment in Isaiah 42, 2 through 4, our judgment about God? He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail or be discouraged until he has set uh, judgment on the earth and the isles and so forth and so on. Uh, no, I don't think that's what it's talking about. If you read just the verse before and look at a different translation, um, you will find um, this is starting in verse 1 in the NIV and all the modern translations. And this has, has to go to the Hebrew word, which can be translated ju judgment or something else. And this is how it's read here. And notice the context when you add the verse before. Here is my servant who I uphold, who my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. So this is talking about Jesus the Messiah. He will not shout or cry out or raise a voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A bruised, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he established justice on the earth. So rather than judgment, all the moderns say justice. But you can, if you understand the true meaning of the word, it's saying he will bring the kingdom of God back to earth. And God's method of rulership is coming back through him, which sets all things right or makes things just or right again. And those are the, that's the right judgment to make about things. Fix it, okay? So that's what it's really saying. Can you comment on a point you brought out? Um, you brought out the point last week. It's re religious leaders did not want to believe without their authority. Today, our organizations want people to believe in the Bible, in the Bible only, regardless of what other organizations say. Uh, no, actually, I would disagree with your premise that religious leadership wants people to believe in the Bible only. That's not true. They want, to believe, they want people to believe in their interpretation of the Bible only not the actual Bible. Um, they want to tell you that, that here's the Bible text and here's what the Bible means in that text and, and, and our interpretation of the Bible is what we want you to believe in. So, so it, it's actually a little bit of, a, of the little shell game where there's a little shift and shell. But, but, and, and if you question their interpretation, then they will come back and say, we take the Bible as it reads. You're trying to interpret it to say, make it say what you want. But they, they, this happens all the time. It happens to me all the time. But it's clear they don't take the Bible as it reads. They never have gone to Deuteronomy and taken the tithe and bought fermented wine and, and celebrated before the Lord and, and uh, given to wine to those who are perishing and beer to those who are suffering. They, they never do that. Say, so I thought you take it as it reads. Well, we have to interpret those verses. They always interpret the stuff they don't like. And then they want you to take literally what they think should be taken literally. It's really not fair. And so this is why Paul said regarding the scriptures and all of these religious things in Romans 14, 5, every person must be fully persuaded in their own mind. God has given every one of you your own individuality, your own capacity for thinking and reasoning, your own power to make decisions. 
and every single person must think for themselves and come to their own conclusion. I am not here. Come and reason is not here to tell anyone what to think. We do actively try to engage you, to challenge you, to present new ideas, new perspectives, but at the end of the day, our goal is for you to go home and think it through for yourself and come to your own conclusion. Now, I've given this metaphor before, but if, 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 if you use this idea, if you went to a math class, okay, the math professor would teach you the principles of math, he would show you how to pro solve some problems, and then give you some problems to solve on your own. And then over the course of time you learn, or there's another way, the math teacher wants everyone to get the right answer because he's been told that only those who get every single answer right will have eternal life. Those who get some wrong will, will, ha will be condemned to eternal hell. And so he doesn't want anyone to be lost. So he gives you the 28 fundamental answers that you must memorize. And you memorize those 28 fundamental answers. When the test comes, you, you write them down, and those are the 28, and they're correct. Number one is 27, number two is three, number four is 11. You, they're the right answers for the problems. And you've memorized them, you put them down in the right place. Do you know how to do math? No. You can't solve a problem if your life depended on it. And that's what much of Christianity has done to people. Here's the right answers, memorize them. Why are they the right? Well, because the Bible said so. My math teacher told me it was right, therefore it's right. We do not want you, even if it's the right answer, to believe it's the right answer because Dr. Jennings said so. Understand it. We want you to understand the reason. God is the God of reality, and when you understand his design laws, protocols, principles, then you are fully persuaded in your own mind, you're settled into the truth, and you become a thinker, not a reflector of other people's thoughts, and you're able to problem solve when new problems arrive that you haven't seen before because you understand how to do math, how to solve problems. And life is a series of problems to solve. I just uh, heard someone in church referencing sins being purged from record books in heaven. And it made me curious. Does the Bible actually say that sins are recorded in record books in heaven? If not, where does the idea come from? Well, there are the, the ideas of records in heaven. It's in Revelation, another place. You can look those up. There's different types of records. There's the deeds recorded in the books that people are judged by. There's the records and the names are recorded in the book of life and so forth. But you understand, this is human language trying to, concept, to, to convey concepts to people in a language we can understand. Um, in Bible times, they had books and they had scrolls or they had parchments. I promise you, there's no paper books in heaven. There's no vellum in heaven. There's no parchments or scrolls in heaven with ink markings on them, keeping lists of things. There's also no magnetic hard drives in heaven or... Um, optical uh, devices that, uh, that register in some type of light recording. So these are just, there's something recorded, okay? If you, and this is to debate the concept that history is real, and as history unfolds, history doesn't get changed, and there's, and there's a knowledge of reality, of history. And so there, there's several different types of books, if you will. One is the book of life. And what's recorded in the book of life, according to scripture? Name. name. And in scripture, name is a symbolic representation for? Character. Character. So it's your unique individuality, your personhood. And so this is what Paul meant, says, you know, um, when, I, when I depart, I'm, I'm eager to depart, uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord, okay? He's to, we, we have three parts. We have a physical body. We have a panuma, spirit, breath, life, energy, and we have a soul, the Greek word for soul is psyche, where we get uh, or psychiatry and psychology. Uh, a computer has electricity, energy, that's the spirit, has a machine, that's the body, and it has software, okay? And it takes all three to be operational. And for us to live or be alive and be operational, we have to have a mind, a psyche, we have to have a, a breath of life, spirit, energy, and we have to have a body. And when the body turns to dust, the Spirit returns to God, the life energy returns to God, but the soul, the individuality, the software, your person is safe and secure with Christ in heaven on the heavenly record books. That's where you're stored, waiting. And this is what Paul says in Thessalonians. He says in Thessalonians, they don't want you to grieve like those who have no hope about those who have fallen asleep. We know that when the Lord returns, he will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Christ. And the dead in Christ will rise first at the trumpet call of God and the voice of the archangel. And we which are alive will be caught up together in the air. Notice in this passage, we have the same dead coming down out of heaven and coming up out of the ground. The same dead in one passage coming from two, but why? Because our individualities are asleep in heaven on the servers waiting to be downloaded into new hardware at the resurrection and then we live again. 
And so if somebody, Jesus said, don't be afraid in, in Matthew 10, 20, don't be afraid of the one who can destroy the body, the machinery, but can't destroy the soul, the software. So if, some, if you had a computer and your computer was backed up on the cloud, put your mind around that. Okay? And somebody says, I'm going to destroy your machine unless you do whatever. You go, no, I'm not afraid of one who can destroy the body. But they can't destroy my, my programming, my software. I'll just go get an upgrade. Guess what? When the Lord comes back, we get an upgrade. Okay. And I'm going to connect to the cloud. I'm going to download. And when you, once you do, you've just resurrected your machine. Okay? This is what the Bible teaches. It's quite reality-based. It's not mythical. It's not magical. It's exactly what the Bible teaches. So, all right, let's close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, the truth that you've revealed to us. We ask that you will continue to enlighten us, transform us, settle us, seal us, and enable us to take this message to set other hearts and minds free, that you will come soon to take us home to be with you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. All right, we're going to now break and set the... There's a short video to watch right now. Show it, Dean. Uh, let me tell you what this video is. Uh, uh, Jacques has made a draft or, uh, of... Uh this video, it's a six-minute video. It's very short. Uh, go ahead and show it. In the beginning, God created the universe, including the planet Earth. The Earth at that time was a formless abyss a deep void covered by darkness, and the Spirit of God hovered over the deep waters. And God said, let light shine forth, and light appeared. God delighted in how good the light was, and the light dispelled the darkness and was separate from it. God named the light day and the darkness he named night. And the nighttime and the daytime were the first day of terraforming planet Earth. And God said, let the waters separate with an atmosphere in between. So God created an atmosphere and separated the water beneath the atmosphere from the water above it. And this was how God originally built the earth. God named the atmosphere sky. And the nighttime and the daytime were the second day of terraforming planet earth. And God said, let the water beneath the sky be gathered to one place and have dry ground appear. And it was so. God named the dry ground land and the gathered waters he named seas and God delighted in how good it was. Then God said, let all varieties of vegetation grow forth from the land, plants that reproduce their kind with seed and trees that produce fruit with seed in it and reproduce more of their kind. And it was so. Instantly, the earth was covered in a rich variety of plants growing from the land, plants producing seed to reproduce more of their kind, and trees producing fruit with seed in it to reproduce more of their kind. And God delighted in how good it was. And the nighttime and the daytime were the third day of terraforming planet Earth. And God said, let there be light seen in the sky to separate the day from the night and to be the standard to mark the days and years and seasons. And let these lights seen in the sky shine light upon the earth. And it was so. God created two great lights, the larger and brighter light to rule the day and the smaller and lesser light to rule the night. He also created the stars of this solar system, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. He created the other stars in the universe prior to terraforming planet Earth. God set them in the heavens above to be seen in the sky and to give light on the Earth, to rule the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God delighted in how good it was. 
and the nighttime and the daytime were the fourth day of terraforming planet Earth. And God said, let the waters swarm with many different swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth throughout the atmosphere. So God created the many varieties of sea creatures, the great and the small, every living creature that teems in the waters, all capable of producing more of their kind, and every winged bird, all capable of producing more of their kind. And God delighted in how good it was. God gave them the blessing of reproductive ability and said, have offspring and increase in number and populate the waters and let the birds increase throughout the earth. And the nighttime and the daytime were the fifth day of terraforming planet Earth. And God said, from the elements of the earth, living creatures will come forth in a rich variety of kinds, those that thrive in loving service to humans, those that serve by roaming free, and those that creep along the ground, each reproducing more of their kind. And it was so. So God created all the animals, some to roam free, some to live in loving partnership with humans, and others to creep along the ground, all capable of reproducing more of their kind and God delighted in how good it was. Then God said, now it is time for the crowning creation, human beings. We will make them in our image with godlike abilities so they can govern the earth in love like we govern the universe. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over all the animals of the land. So God created human beings in his own image with godlike abilities. He designed them to be like him, one in love. Therefore, he created humankind, male and female. God blessed them with procreative ability and said to them, have offspring and increase in number, fill the earth and develop its full potential. In love, govern over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living creature that moves on the earth just like we govern the universe. Then God said, Behold, all the seed-bearing plants and trees with fruit with seed in it throughout the entire earth, I give you to be your food. And the animals that move on the earth and the birds of the air, every creature that has the breath of life, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God delighted in all that he had made, for it was very good. And the nighttime and the daytime were the sixth day of terraforming planet Earth. 